And we're off. I'm going to share my screen. So thank you everyone for joining another edition of the Hyperlayer Healthcare uh, Special Interest Group. My name is Mike McCoy. I'm luckily the chair of the group. Uh, first off, we want to state that uh, this is an open source working group and an open source special working uh, special interest group. And so anything that is proprietary information, information under NDA, or information you or your employer would not want to disclose into a public forum, please refrain from doing so. As well as we have a general rule here: be kind and nice to everyone. Uh, please do not uh, interrupt other people talking. Uh, there's, we want open thought, open appreciation, and open courtesy to everyone. No idea is a dumb idea. Uh, in fact, any potential dumb idea could be a great startup idea in many type of ways. Uh, so please just have an open mind and, and thank you for joining in today's session. Uh, today's pretty brief. It's, it's just a general meeting, uh, but I wanted to go over some things that are kind of uh, new in, in the scope in our world within blockchain, healthcare, and decentralization. One, we're going to go over uh, health wallet apps or digital passport apps that are um, as of... Uh, of relevance and kind of compare and contrast what we're seeing in the industry. I want to also go over the decentralized uh, clinical trials within uh, DTRA and kind of give a little bit of uh, background to that and understand from others that are more uh, applicable and close to that. I'm sure Debbie Bucci and others uh, who are a part of that consortia uh, could, could give uh, uh, shine a better bright light into that, as well as I got reached out to a group of part of UT Austin. Um, they are part of the Dell Medical School in particular, who are doing research on blockchain in a number of different realms uh, with a, uh, a, a project called Metalinker. And so wanted to forward this on to you all as they may be looking for more opportunities for people to help uh, kind of open source their thoughts, their ideas, and and maybe something for everyone to join as well. Um, and then I also am hoping to get uh, people from either the Common, the Commons Foundation or Common Pass to be able to present at our next presentation on the 17th. I am in contact with them pretty closely, I would say. And so I'd like to see if they can be able to give us a presentation on them uh, as, as we're probably familiar with all the ID stuff. So um, questions on anything? Oh, also uh, for event purposes, Right now, as we are speaking, there is actually an IEEE Blockchain and AI Ethics Day presentation, which is led by one of our friends, Sean Mannion, uh, and, and a bunch of others. I highly suggest once you are done this meeting, please head over there. Uh, it's an interesting forum and uh, one that I support. And Erica is actually supporting that event right now. So that is why she can't be with us today. But, um, but yeah, thank you, for, uh, thank you guys for all showing up. Any other questions? All right, we'll kick it off with uh, one of our, our main agendas. So, so smart cards, smart health pass. I think this is one of the more uh, innovative projects coming out into the, uh, the digital identity space today. So an individual named Josh Mandel, who does his day job is within um, Microsoft in particular, but smart health cards are not in particular a Microsoft product uh, as I've, uh, uh, sorry, as, as to my knowledge, right? So Josh has been able to create this in open source software, a product that helps connect and uh, verify credentials in the W3C Evernim type of standard uh, so that we can be able to have a conceptual model of via a mobile application, be able to verify whether you have a COVID-19 vaccination or not. And uh, I thought this paper was one of great representation and kind of an overview for lay readers to be able to go into the details, as well as towards the bottom here, there are specific uh, did specifications that I thought were pretty, pretty informational as far as how someone could be able to do and install this from a long form signature to a short term signature of the different encryption algorithms and methods for that, as well as uh, uh, it's been my understanding that a lot of this is just wrapped into a JWT token um, in particular, and that through the JWT, you can be able to access that token in many different platforms and ways. I know there are other ways to be able to do this uh, in, in, um, in kind of the digital ID realm, but I uh, wanted to have this as an open forum for anyone, especially Jim, Debbie, Ben, uh, anyone else who, who'd like to step up and, and 
tell their experience with smart health cards in particular. And to me, what I've heard from the Common Foundation in particular is that they're referencing their architecture to do the Common Pass project with that broad consortia of many different folks, including Epic, Cerner, Microsoft, Salesforce, et cetera. I heard they were looking to model it off of this in particular, but I'd love to, I, I want to have better understanding. I'm sure we all want to have better understanding of what that truly is. So, so Jim, please take it away. Sure. And I only, I will try and keep this in less than two minutes. Uh, Jim St. Clair, Chief Trust Officer for Lumetic. Lumetic's a health tech company owned by uh, Providence Health Systems in Seattle. Um, uh, I am in my role uh, uh, leading the Lumetic Exchange, which is a consortium of participants to define uh, verifiable credential use cases for uh, for health transactions all around decentralized patient identity and, and patient-centered data, data management. By practical necessity for uh, for Providence Health Systems, our first use case is, uh, is a COVID-19 vaccination credential, which we're rolling out for Providence based on Epic uh, this week. Um, I'm also active in Good Health Pass, which includes representatives from uh, IATA, uh, MasterCard, ID2020, Evernim, myself, a couple others. Um, we are, I guess I'd just describe it as interfacing with VCI. We're not an active VCI participant, but I am part of Josh's group on Fire Chat with regards to developing the, the smart wallets. Um, I'm also a member of, uh, of CCI, which is, is free to join and also now falls under, under Brian's supervision in, the, in Linux Foundation. Um, I, we kind of speak to it specifically from what we're doing. We have a credential. It is designed and based around interface with Epic. Also takes into account uh, other business processes such as the uh, state immunization information system, IIS. Um, uh, Josh's approach is, uh, is fine. Um, it does rely on things like Fire Release 4, which hasn't been commercially promulgated yet. Um, uh, also, they use the, the ION public did method, which is... Uh, 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 and and SciTree, which is different from the Hyperledger Aries um, Indie implementation structure, um, but um, uh, it, it's a straightforward approach for for doing some things. Um, with our focus being on deployment for Providence as the ninth largest healthcare uh, organization in the country, um, in conjunction with other conversations we're having with Mastercard and others, and uh, uh, you know that's that's got us very focused. But we're happy to contribute to VCI. Uh, and, and collaborate based on our experience so far rolling it out. And, and if anybody has any questions or anything else I could, I could offer, Good Health Pass is moving along and we'll, they, have a web, they have a web page uh, up right now, a coming soon web page I can share here in the, in the chat real quick and um, they'll have some further announcements. What, what differentiates Good Health Pass is that we see ourselves as kind of a, uh, an, uh, a broad umbrella organization across these various initiatives. So much of the focus is around vaccination credentials, which is great. But if you consider the ecosystem of, of global travel and return to business, um, uh, I certainly foresee it as a combination of vaccine, yes or no, serological test, yes or no, and current COVID tests, PCR test, yes or no and some combination therein for affirming the, the safety for, for folks to travel again. And, and uh, uh, there has been less focus on the testing side and more focus on the vaccination side, but from a travel perspective, we see it including all of it. And if you could, so, so Good Health Pass is part of the Lumetic Exchange, and that's the product that you are using for like a digital health pass, if you want it, or a digital health Great question. Passport. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mike. I threw a lot out there all at once and I apologize. But uh, Lumetic uh, has the Lumetic Connect product. The Lumetic Connect product is built on the Aries stack with verifiable credentials um, configured in, in Microsoft Azure and, and uh, uh, basically approved through Providence Health Systems from a, a HIPAA compliance architecture design standpoint. Um, uh, the exchange is a semi-autonomous group of participants identifying new use cases, which we intend to develop into actual uh, JSON schema for use of verifiable credentials as part of the connect and exchange process to foster and encourage and advocate for using verifiable credentials for, uh, for patient engagement scenarios. Um, and then uh, we, we participate as a, as a consortium in Good Health Pass, um, but Good Health Pass isn't as an organization directly affiliated with us. 
Got it. That's very helpful clarification. Thank you. Yeah, I threw a lot out there. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, through VCI, so I'm on part of the VCI meetings in, in some regard through, because in my day job is I'm at Humana. We're part of the Karen Alliance. Karen Alliance is a member yes. of VCI. Yep. Uh, and Ryan Howes and I are talking on Monday. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So is VCI looking to use the smart health cards initiative or is that something different that from your knowledge that they are, are basing their architecture on? No, great question. So VCI as an organization is, uh, is more or less committed to leveraging Josh's um, smart health uh, cards wallet concept for the, the credential mechanism. Okay, so they are looking to use smart health cards. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, you, you know, as I said, it's a, it, it is a, it is a a, a technical, it is one technical approach. Uh, it isn't the approach we happen to choose to make because we developed uh, through Providence with their Epic system for specific Epic application and and other use case requirements within the health system. Um, but, um, but, but it is a viable approach that, uh, that Josh has come up with. So if I were to share my screen then real quick, and let's go into kind of their, their documentation, where, where would you see, uh, where would you see aspects or features and everyone please chime in. Does anyone else have anything they want to add to the smart card VCI or, or even the little medic stuff here now? Hello, Jim. It's hey, Doug. Good to see you again. <laughs> you too, my friend. <laughs> I uh, had a good long talk with uh, Mike Nash a while back. Um, by the for the rest of the group, I'm a leader group of a project becoming a company called Fireblocks. Um, we are deeply engaged with Microsoft on verifiable credentials and VID. I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to talk about it. We've got a non-disclosure agreement, but. In as much as I presented it at the um, uh, fire dev days, I guess I can talk about it some. I got the um, approval uh, to do that much anyway. Um, but anyhow, the uh, I'm, I'm it's a strange disconnect I'm having inside Microsoft. There is a you know, it's a big organization, lots of people mm -hmm. doing lots of different things. They've got such a commanding space in the Active Directory. Um, this Microsoft identity platform generally in the MIP. Um, then there's another group that's um, heads down on uh, ION, which as those of you are following that through the DIFF project, SideTree is having some difficulties um, reaching workability. So we are also, our platform is also on, actually we're on Fabric, we haven't moved to Aries yet. Um, but we, uh, we developed a series of proof of concepts of a lot of the same things that Medic's doing with a focus more on consent management than uh, health passes and the like. We, everybody wants to talk, talk to us about that. And we are, our answer is that there's too many other good people working on that problem. We believe that the, um, um, fine grained consent management is the active ingredient in so many things to come. So we're using verifiable credentials to create um, actually three things, a, an identity, we call it IDVC, a CVC or a consent verifiable credential, and then an RVC or resource verifiable credential so that you can actually move data uh, around. Um, pivoting on the fact that the patient themselves generally is not the, the uh, target of HIPAA, 21st century cures, or set, et cetera. So in other words, the, the method of our madness is that when the patient is in control of the flow of their identity, their consent, and the actual protected health information itself, um, a large part of the, the regulatory friction just dissolves. Um, so that's kind of our focus. Uh, when I talked to Mike Nash, I guess 
gosh, must have been back in November. Um, we were kind of comparing war stories about Microsoft and we said we were gonna get back together first the year to see where we respectively stood. And Jim, maybe we can do that now. Maybe now's a good time for us to compare notes. Yeah, that couldn't have connected the dots better. And obviously Mike's my boss. Um, and um, uh, since you brought up the topic, I actually have a meeting an hour from now with my product manager uh, and another colleague of mine from the Human Colossus Foundation. Uh, and we're both part of the Trust Over IP Foundation, another, another Linux uh, Foundation project for those who aren't familiar with it. And, uh, and we're talking about his, um, his consent model and object capture overlays and what we've done with fire. Um, I, yeah, I don't think it involves an NDA because Paul is very, very open about the work they're doing, but I think it would be worth the discussion because I think McCann, first of all, I agree hundred percent with the way you summarized um, aspects of patient consent and privacy in the Cures Act. And, and we really are trying to turn things on their head by making it patient centric um, starting first with um, identification, authentication, and then extending into consent and what that consent model means for chain consent across data and conditional consent. Um, so I'd love to compare notes with you kind of on your approach. And, uh, and I think that there is, there is grounds for some sort of innovation lab here in the near future uh, around these ideas, not because one technical approach is better than another, but quite frankly, to start changing the cultural thinking about how, how people ma manage their identity and consent. Right. And, uh, and philosophically, I think being involved with, with HCF, which is based in, uh, in Switzerland and, uh, and GDPR and the Data Services, Digital Services Act and the Data Governance Act, um, Europe is taking a, a, a radically different approach going forward in the future to data protection and data consent than the U.S. has caught up to, but there's just no way, in my opinion, that, that activities that strong won't wash on our shores. And now is the time to start thinking about that from an architectural standpoint. Well, yeah, yeah. CCPA is already in California, which is basically right. Americanized GDPR. Right. Um, so I have a question in particular uh, with the kind of tech arc that I'm sure others have uh, within the group as well. And some of the people are, are messaged me as well. Uh, when someone doesn't have a smart mobile device, there's talk of being able to use a QR code to then either attach it to a physical device like an NFC or an ID card, right? So they could be able to hold that and then go back to the, the, uh, the issuer to then mm -hmm. register and say, hey, I actually have either the credentials to then verify me and then moving forward, or it's taking some type of biometric and storing that within the issuer. Uh, in this method, I liked, uh, I liked the smart health cards uh, format of being able to scan that QR code. And then there, there's other companies and we had a presenter two weeks ago say they're doing it through this card called Tangem. And anyone can create a Tangem like card where you have just a, you know, you have a physical like identification card that then can bring you to many different places. I wanted to hear some of your take on that from anybody that believes what is the best method to help identify those that may not have smart devices and car and, and phones at the moment. I'm, I'm real biased to my friend, uh, Peter Simpson, who runs iRespond. Um, Peter has been part of uh, IIW and the world of SSI for years um, uh, alongside Drummond Reed, for those who know Drummond. Um, I respond has, uh, matter of fact, he's stuck in Bangkok, as a matter of fact, even though he's from Seattle, uh, but they have been engaged in a range of international products for years to design um, digital, uh, to design attestation, physical attestation documents that can be uh, QR code driven and interoperable with digital identities in self-sovereign identity principles but are made from uh, what, one of two manufacturers in the world that develop the paper for things like passports. So it is a foldable, bug-proof, waterproof sort of attestation, whether it's a birth certificate, vaccine credential, et cetera, um, with a QR code in it uh, that you can physically carry for those populations that don't have access to a smart device. But that QR code will connect you with um, um, some decentralized ledger associated with that identity in conjunction with biometrics. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that quite frankly, to me, seems to, especially because he's done this for 
UNICEF and for World Bank and, and others, it's it's real and it's out there. And uh, and I would defer to him to present more on it. I'm personally more of the um, kind of the Pareto optimization school <laughs> that uh, has shaped fire and most everything else, I guess. And that, you know, the 80 20 thing that if you can, uh, you know, the, the bulk of the market, I mean, it's, it's amazing how, how pervasive smart phones have gotten. And of course, they're not at all incompatible with QR codes, the camera um, and the method, even in Josh Mandel's presentation of using the QR code, um, you know, as a reader uh, to prompt a transaction to occur. So, you know, you're going to get upward of 80% of the entire Western civilization, you know, with smartphones. Um, and uh, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but but um, I'll say from a first world perspective, yes. But when you're taking the global perspective into account, there's like 60% of the world that doesn't okay. have access to a device. All right. And I, I guess I'm just, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Elitist. I don't know. I, we're in our case. We're focusing on the U.S. And uh, whenever the question comes up, even desktop, you know, I say, well, "Don't you want to do this desktop?" It's, of course you can, but you've got to introduce other authenticators. I mean, if if identity, if deep proofed identity, you know, Cures Act now is pushing for IAL level two, you know, which goes way beyond its username, password kind of things you have to have actual biometric authenticators in some cases you actually have to go to a government issued photo id so you know even for a desktop you've got you start to have to talk about hardware you know ub keys and the like so again the you know the, the bullseye and not only the bullseye but 90 percent of the target um, is handled in ordinary Android and iOS. And that's kind of where we're- so, No, that's a, that's a very valuable point. But I, I think Debbie could maybe help clarify questions on the interoperability piece. Uh, there's many different sign-ons people can use, right? Whether you're using a username, password, and, and a different, you know, there's different portals of different applications people will have to want to be able to store this. Uh, Debbie, do you have ideas on how someone can interoperate that data across, let's just say, if, if Epic has a specific database system with that, without having to create a whole vaccine credentials initiative, what's a way that someone can interoperate that data safely and, and in, a, in, a, in a viable way? Is that a question to me? Or are you talking about like yeah. federated access, right? Being, um, I mean, certainly in the, DID world, they, to be able to recognize a different authentication method should be a way to, to move it forward, I think. 100%. And, and I don't think there's been methods or ways we've talked about being able to make different authentication methods viable in here. It's just been one consortia, you use that consortia, and you're able to then just work within that consortia. There's, there's not as much creative work around how we can get it, not just from the VCI initiative, but in the CCI and the, the Linux for Public Health initiative, and then for uh, some of these other groups that we're talking about here on the side too. It's, it's, it's how do we create that uh, kind of rail of information as well. I would have for anybody that might like to respond to it is we scratch our head every day on um, kind of the intersection between public policy and technology here. What what's going to be the guiding, you know, bar that has to be cleared? Is it the 21st Century Cures Act? Is it GDPR? What is it? You know, is that that has a huge impact? Most of the even the current multi-factor authentication methods, which in the most part aren't really multi-factor, they're just one and a half factors. It's called two-factor, um, uh, but normal authentication methods aren't going to suffice if we think that ONC is going to adhere, in America anyway, uh, to the letter of the Cures Act. And, you know, you talk to different people and it's, no one seems to know, you know, really whether um, 
you know, what the resolve of the government, U.S. government so, is going to be. Well, that I, I, you know, I don't know whether I would take that focus, whether you focus on ONC. When it comes to um, implementation, I think more of the focus should be to NIST. And certainly through regulations, there is a required co collaboration. Mm -hmm. And specifically, I would look at 863-3, which is going to four. And as far as I can tell, DRDs and the encryption to support it, even though there have been um, uh, letters and, and recommendations and comments towards it, it's not approved yet. So I think where for to move these efforts ahead to be really accepted by government i think it's focusing on what a uh, nisc nis will do and what uh, what type of cryptology crypto cryptography they would accept around that um i think uh policy is secondary because they it, they need to point to standards in the first place all right well that's very first helpful. opinion but the dozen o and c are the the current um Oh, well, I can't remember the, the rhyme and verse of the, the section of the um, Cures Act refers directly to NIST 803 um, as the minimum standard. Uh, right. whether that, so is that, are they gonna hold to that or, or is that, is that gonna slip? That's kind of our question. But it really does make a huge difference in you know, what kind of verifiable credential for identity you're gonna have to have uh, to be fully compliant and who cares you know is it the um, you know is it somebody like providence in our case duke is our kind of our guiding idn or health system you, you get different opinions you know of whether they're going to worry much about that or not well historically they've been closely coupled and the idea that um you need to involve government exchange in this. I think uh, for actual technology pieces, not the policy piece, will you bless this and this will help my product or two different things. <laughs> but if you're looking for the interoperability of a product um, to be able to be recognized, and I think it's more technically, it's it, the focus should be probably be NIST or other standard bodies that, um, that other regulators may point to in the long run. HX7, IAT, those yeah. kind of things. If they support it, then I, I, that's a part of it. I mean, do you need the hammer or could industry actually collaborate in a ways that um, government would fall in line or at least ad adopt? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see. And, and now, uh, if I could add, Linux, uh, Linux for Public Health is an initiative that Brian Bellendorf actually is taking on as kind of the executive director. He's kind of shifting his role into not only being the executive director of all Hyperledger, but being the healthcare lead. He has experience, I believe, working in kind of um, EHR, just uh, database and systems realms of the medical systems in the past. And so what, they're, what Linux for Public Health is looking to do now is they're looking to increase memberships into a consortia so that uh, all organizations, like we, we get requested every day from Linux for Public Health, do you wanna join uh, from, from my day job, right? Do you wanna be able to sign on as a membership so we can be able to build out CCI initiatives? And then uh, I know for one, Jim is part of Lumetic that has Lumetic Exchange, which is trying to be a governance body similar to Linux for Public Health as well. Uh, so there's there's plenty of options for people to join into here too. Uh, I think each consortia and governance body is valuable. Uh, my main thing in all these building of networks is can the networks talk to each other? Do we have technical feasibility to be able to do so? Um, those are the comments I'm I'm really looking out for. I would love to hear if anyone has any thoughts on that. Yes. <clears throat> hey, yes, Mike. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, as a vendor, you know, just trying to navigate this, uh, uh, so some kind of a guidance, you know, we showed, uh, like you just mentioned two weeks ago, 
an integration using the open fire standards from epic and uh, you know obviously they have something um, is there some guidance that we can get so that this question of uh, getting data from uh, ehr you know uh, electronic health records if we say that that is the master and there is some identity and verification being done there then it will make the the workflow of how we can integrate the issuance of credentials into that and of course the second piece of the puzzle is uh, is i think what debbie kind of touched on a little bit earlier which is uh, can uh, the uh, trifecta of the our favorite issuer holder verifier can any issuer work with any holder or wallet with any verifier i think those are the two uh, kind of large uh, um, questions that uh, that me as a a vendor trying to put a solution out there with uh, we showed some examples with salesforce and so on so uh, that's what we are looking for uh, i think and guidance from this group is of course uh, critical so that we we can build to some set of standards yeah and salesforce is going out and saying hey we're just going to be the the platform you all use if you have salesforce as a company right now you can be able to just easily plug into our dashboard for free and be able to upload all the the vaccination records of all your employees people in your network even sometimes for partnering networks uh that you can be able to see it and so salesforce is in the business to see it and azure within you know smart health cards so smart health cards and microsoft as we said in the chat here they are not connected as of now and they um, they did that deliberately from my perspective in in conversations with them so that they wouldn't be held to that vendor locking problem that we're all kind of discussing here uh, and getting government buy in to understand hey when we store these can we have these in a in an interoperable manner in an interoperable manner so that not one vendor makes more money off of the 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 storage of this data um, but yeah I think it's, it's highly valuable questions we all wanna consider. Does anyone have any answers rather than questions to add to that statement? If, if not, I, I can move on to uh, next on decentralized clinical trials. All right, thank you everyone for the input on the identity portion of the conversation. So. Uh, next up, I want to share uh, some information on a release on this project and network called Decentralized Clinical Trials, or sorry, Decentralized Trials and Research Alliance. Uh, they recently came out with an article on, God, I hate this thing, this bar above, within STAT that uh, talks about all the different organizations and pharmaceutical companies that are coming together to recruit broadly for uh patient population and ownership so that we could be able to do remote monitoring and communicate for people at home to do trials rather than having to go to physical uh, bodies. Uh, I know there's there's many that are on this call that may be involved in DTRA. For anyone that is part of the consortium, does anyone have any words or uh, thoughts as to where they believe uh, some of the collaborations going to drive more and, and, and where they hope they could be successful within this working group? I believed it was an interesting uh, consortia. So if you go on to the site, right, you get to see um, all the members who have joined. Sorry, this bar is, the Zoom bar is getting away from everything. Um, to see all the members. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of big players out here. I mean, my former employer in Accenture, AWS, AstraZeneca, BI, you name it. Um, I think one of the, does anyone know the exact first working group uh, like or statement of work they're looking to produce uh, for this? I thought it was in particular just getting able to have uh, patient identities interoperated between this, but would love to know if it's something beyond that. Cool. Anyone, just any thoughts? 
and added questions that we were able to have as a group on DTRA in particular. All right, moving on. So uh, last on our agenda, I wanted to bring up the University of Texas Austin Metalinker as uh, come the spring, they're looking to bring on uh, additional folks to help with uh, shaping of their mission. They're trying to create an electric uh, medical record system that, uh, that helps with interoperability. They have funding from the Dell Medical School. They're looking to use patient identifiers. They are currently, I believe, using Indy. Don't know if they're using Ares or Ursa for um, the library and encryption methods, but uh, you can be able to see more here in this link. I'll share it in the tab. Uh, not many things to say here other than if you want, you can reach out to the people directly on um, a contact page on here. So, uh, so yeah, I'll just put this in the link and uh, look forward to, to the research here. I've, I've worked with this group um, before just uh, understanding how we could uh, combine medical research together, research papers from lay material to others. Um, but yeah, seems like an interesting project. And then uh, if anyone, uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I'll, I'll show the link in the chat right now. But if anyone else, open forum for questions or, or comments uh, within the, the world of healthcare and blockchain, I'd love to hear anyone's opinion on, on any other news that's going on of things that are, are of interest to you. Uh, Mike did it. Uh, sorry, I was a little late, but uh, you know, there is the vaccine credentials initiative in addition, obviously CCI is smart of LF uh, right now, but there is a separate consortium again, back to Salesforce, Oracle, Accenture, and they are kind of coming up with their own. That's one block. And then the IATA has come up with its own. So yeah, we did, uh, Mahesh, we did mention the uh, Vaccine Credentials Initiative, which is MITRE, EPIC, Center, yes. Salesforce, Microsoft, um, and then an alliance that my company is a part of called the Karen Alliance, which is, um, yeah, and, and about IATA and, and, and the acronym version of all that, too. Um, yeah, we did go over those. Okay, all right. So that would, again, be of great interest, too. They can be part of this. Um, we'll, I'd like to hear what is it that I'm trying to figure out what is it that they are trying to do, which is different than what CCI LF is doing and uh, see if uh, we can all drive towards the same end. So, yeah, Mahesh, have you reached out to the CCI folks about uh, joining Linux for Public Health? Um, I think they would really appreciate your product. Oh, well, CCI is part of Linux for Public Health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But I think that CCI is really the one that are creating the governance and the kind of standard framework. Yes. And then Linux, the Linux for Public Health is doing more the technical build, correct? Or am I? Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, LFPH has so far developed the open source um, COVID uh, detection early warning system. Yeah. And then and then CCI is supposed to contribute more to LFPH with, with what they develop. But so far with CCI, I mean, we've, we've developed a preliminary governance framework uh, and, and just kind of looking to see what next steps are, so. Yeah, I know CCI is uh, shopping right now for code bases. So uh, Mahesh, definitely reach out to CCI folks. Um, sure. Yes, I am uh, in touch with, uh, you know, seeing Jim and uh, Lucy and others. So we will certainly, uh, I think they are forming a, a more immediate group. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim. Uh, yeah. To, to focus specifically on the COVID-19 vaccine part of the story. So far, it's been more around the governance uh, and uh, will surely participate there. I'm very much uh, attending those too. Thank you. Yeah, and Mahesh, you've got a great solution too with MedCreds too, or uh, uh, I'm sorry, you just recently changed the name. I apologize for it. Yeah. Veracred, Veracred. <laughs> very cred, yeah. Veracred, that's it, exactly. Yeah, he presented to our group last uh, two, two Wednesdays ago and that was, we really, really appreciate it. Anything else, Guillermo? What's going on, on your side of the world this this these days with healthcare and blockchain? Well, uh, we we are uh, we are not quite aligned. Actually, uh, one of my 
uh, goals, uh, because I don't remember if I told you that I participated in an organization in Mexico who, uh, who has uh, almost all the IT companies that uh, try, I mean, it's an organization where participated Amazon, Microsoft, and, and almost all the uh, global and local uh, IT companies. One of the things that we are doing is trying to help the government to change, you know, some of the best practices that uh, uh, in other countries are applying, especially in healthcare, because I'm part of the healthcare digital committee in Mexico. Uh, but honestly, uh, you know, it's very hard because this government uh, is not quite uh, um, excited about the technology. Actually, uh, yesterday they launched a kind of a portal where all the uh, people uh, above 60s, 60 years old can uh, you know, apply for a vaccine and they have to register there. Uh, and, you know, the, in, in five minutes, the, uh, the, the portal was just a uh, crash. So, so it's, it's very hard for us. I mean, uh, in terms of the uh, technology, because the policies from this government is, is quite uh, savings. Uh, rather than to create uh, efficiencies into the process. And uh, well, even that, uh, you know, we as an industry, we are working in to take, put in place uh, some of the uh, best practices, but uh, uh, it's more an initiative from the private uh, uh, companies rather than the public ones. So. I believe that you know this government has also four years uh, beyond. So let's see. I mean, we are pushing very hard to do that. So this kind of information that you share with us is is very useful for us because at least we are passing that information to you know to 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 the uh, community that I participated. But honestly, I don't see that uh, we are good to get traction of uh, blockchain, at least in these two, three years. That's that's yeah. sad, but but it's I, I have to be honest about well, that. We hope that they all go to you for all advice and for all uh, for all consulting and, and any type of way and advisory for sure. Uh, I do want to point out um, that Linux for Public Health has done a couple presentations for their APAC teams. So uh, especially with the Hong Kong team. And so okay. Linux for Public Health in particular believes that they might get some uh, government buy-in uh, to be able to initiate some POCs around vaccination credentials that could be stored on decentralized ledger in particular, uh, kind of the method we're all talking about as well. Um, I also, though, if, if anyone didn't have any other topics, I kind of have a, an opinion on, um, so Coindesk released a, a statement about IBM that the, <laughs> that it's a shell of its former self, that the whole blockchain team is gone, there's all these job cuts and it's ending. Uh, fair estimate and fair opinion on that. Um, for me, it's kind of what consensus had to do about a year ago uh, with cutting the cutting specific special teams so they could focus more into financial services and especially DeFi. That is pretty much really what has happened within the IBM uh, team as of now too. They had to cut a lot of the POC teams. They had to cut a lot of the uh, marketing teams and they had to cut a lot of, in particular, uh, non-supply chain, non-identity teams as the rest of them weren't making money. So a lot of the other ones were kind of like NFT type of solutions or collectible or merchandising type of solutions. They had to cut a lot of the people from there because they weren't generating any revenue. The international teams are still within IBM. Uh, in fact, they've actually taken plus some leadership from R3 to be able to uh, build out the IBM teams, not only in the United States, but also in the UK and across the globe as well. Uh, uh, enterprise blockchain really isn't going anywhere. I got a lot of texts from folks in um, different circles like, oh, are they really going away? Is enterprise blockchain gone? I don't think any of that is happening. In fact, uh, not only in the United States, but uh, 
we at Humana have our product that's going to be launched in the next week or so. That's a fully blockchain product with a bunch of payers. Uh, I know there, there's, there's other um, blockchain consortia, especially in healthcare, I can't name publicly that are coming to form as of, as of well in the United States. Uh, there's others, there's Pharma Ledger that, that's growing in popularity more than ever. Uh, mostly in the EU and some of the United States as well. And then um, Nippon Express, uh, pharmaceutical supply chain tracking, that project over in Japan is getting full steam ahead. So there's many different projects out there. I don't think you have to worry about enterprise blockchain going anywhere, going anywhere anytime soon. And for all the startups that, that a lot of you run here in this group, uh, there's plenty of work to be had and I'm sure businesses is doing well. But anyone have an opinion on, on this or, or a similar or, or even different perspective is, is this really an, an exodus that, uh, that they'd like to discuss? I think that blockchain has had hype for five years. I think anytime there's an opportunity to write an article about blockchain hype, they take it. But I think we also see, um, you know, IBM uh, working with Walmart to do blockchain for their supply chain couldn't be a better attestation as to its acceptance in some cases. But, you know, I, um, I tell my wife about this. I'm like, look, nobody goes to a Honda dealership to buy a 2.4 liter VTEC engine. They're, they're going to buy an Accord and they like the features on the Accord. And one of those features that, that sets it apart is a VTEC engine. And, and we're moving blockchain out of the buzz, I think, and into more mainstream where you would select it just like you would an Oracle database. And so, you know, a lot of the, of the hype expenditures, whether it's consensus or IBM or, or, or Deloitte or whoever is getting, getting paired back to align its actual lines of business. 100%. That Walmart initiative, they're doing a lot with the University of Arkansas too. So all yeah, the graduates yeah. that are coming out of that program, they have like over 100, 150 million going into that program in particular to do different pilots, POCs, and then get graduates to then come in just working specifically on supply chain blockchain for Walmart. Yeah. So I mean, shit, that, that's gonna, that's a lot of money. And yeah, I know yeah. that they're going through an IBM specific program too. Yeah. And you probably saw Anthony Day's post on LinkedIn. He's like garbage article. You know, it, it doesn't capture anything about the substance of where they're going with it. They're just doing it at scale behind the scenes. And, and, you know, that doesn't get, that doesn't get uh, buzzworthiness. So. Yeah. I'll uh, add just as a, tiny, tiny blockchain vendor. Uh, I wear another hat, sell a product. Uh, Mike, I think I've talked to you about it, about uh, loyalty solution, for example. We are in very active pursuit uh, with the big guys, Oracle and so on, providing a very niche uh, solution to a larger ecosystem. Uh, and you, you know, it's interesting. I'm just, as a matter of fact, I've been on a call since 3 a.m. this morning on some final negotiations with a customer in Asia. And the questions are no more about why do you use the blockchain? It's a very detailed, just like how, so the only question the customer had uh, in my last round with them is what is your TPS? How much can you handle? We are going to have so many million customers, right? So this is the kind of conversation that we are moving to, wherein just like how Jim said, nobody talks about we use some Oracle database or something in the background, right? They are more interested is, hey, can your system scale to this level? So that is uh, one part of the story. And my second take on that article uh, is again, uh, it's like anything else, right? Very, very large companies need a gigantic base. For example, when you are in the open source world, like we are in with Hyperledger products on the blockchain, the, the, the model in which they make money is like uh, the you know, Linux versions are sold by Oracle and every major vendor and support is uh, sold for the Linux operating system. So they're able to scale that to millions and millions of copies that they'll be able to make money. So they'll have to go through this readjustments until blockchain starts getting applied to that level of scale. And then they'll have a role, uh, which is similar to how they had for all sorts of other open source products. So that's where in the initial phases of adoption, where we are doing a lot of custom solutions, um, this, you know, if you have the 50 people in bench, uh, you just can't survive. Uh, while somebody like me might be able to, because I have one or two guys. That's uh, that's my <laughs> lean and mean. Love to hear it. That's a great, that's a great strategy for anyone. Yeah, Mahesh, I think you hit it on the nail, uh, hit hit the nail on the head. I mean, we are not a blockchain company. We're an inform a patient information logistics company, and our focus is on patient identity, patient centric management of their data, 
um, privacy preserving, HIPAA compliant, GDPR respecting. And the fact that blockchain happens to be in there is something architecturally you don't have to tell anybody. Exactly. And then that's where we are coming to even outside the very well-defined privacy. I'm doing the same on the loyalty space, wherein we are saying, this just happens to be a technology we are using, which we believe is appropriate for the next uh, stage of uh, loyalty applications. That's it. And uh, it, it's no more or no less than that. Yeah, for the, the old guys in the crowd, people that were around when the internet was young, uh, might remember a famous article I can't remember who it was wrote it. It was New York Times or Fortune. But anyway, it was published and republished everywhere. And the title of it was Amazon.bomb. <laughs> now you've got, uh, anyway, it was, it was a thoughtful treatise on why Amazon would soon be out of business. And this was, um, you know, um, early 20th century, kind of uh, 21st century prose. So I wouldn't, I would take all, there's just something about the press that just somebody, somebody alluded to a second ago that just really gravitates toward gloom and doom stories. <laughs> I don't know why. I, uh, I did see an economic uh, article, like a research paper come out that uh, statistically more than, more than not, there'll be negative press than anything else, just because mm -hmm. it gets more clicks, all those other things. But um, it was way more of a detailed review. Uh, I wanted to ask the group here if you think this type of format is more relevant than having uh, organized general uh, forum discussion, because uh, this was very informal. We just went over a couple topics and then kind of talked about it. I'd love to hear your feedback because I get mixed reviews on it. I hear, yes, this is awesome. I learned so much. I feel like I'm part of the group and uh, it, it talks about real world issues and things that are, and obviously like I, Health pass and digital credentials are timely. And so we're talking about it here today, but I wanted to hear your feedback. You can either email me separately uh, from this, or you can speak up now if you like this type of format to be had within the special interest group, working groups. Uh, I, I'm trying to get it to where we have open forum, then have a presentation, open forum, then presentation, uh, so that we all feel like we're having a say and being part of the conversation and not just listening and, and, and sitting back. And so uh, any feedback is good from, from all you uh, on this type of uh, format. So Mike, we'll send you an email. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Uh, I'm not gonna send a Google form email. Uh, just if you wanna separate, I think you guys have my email whenever I, um, Yes. I Whenever do. I send it out. So yeah, just let me know if this is valuable. Um, I'm trying to, as I said, in two weeks, have the Commons Foundation be able to present their findings and, and what they believe are, are, are beneficial within the VCI um, uh, Vaccine Credentials Initiative. Sorry for anyone that doesn't know that abbreviation. But yeah, um, uh, that's, that's all I got, guys. Uh, <laughs> I hope you have a great rest of your week. Does anyone want to mention any other news, happenings, events that I might not be familiar with? The dog agrees. Yeah, dogs, Doug's yeah. dog uh, really looks to have you have to show the dog. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I well, thank you real everyone quick for the a related note. Uh, when this meeting ends, and, and I could provide the link real quick, but uh, OMG has, the object management group has an RFI out for disposable self sovereign identity. And uh, the, the webinar for it's kicking off in, uh, in just a couple minutes. Yeah, do you have the, yeah, send that link in the chat here. Um, yeah. I think those that are free would love to join. All right, everyone, thank you very much for the time. And, uh, and I will see you guys in two weeks on the 17th. We might have Common, Common Foundation or we might have someone else. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.